excellent, you know, this gives us the, the chance to, uh, to interrogate you a bit further. That's a scary way of putting it. <laughs> oh, you <laughs> wait till we're at the end. Um, who did you write this book for? Who did you have in mind you know, when, when you were writing? Who, who was your ideal audience? So I was really writing this for thinking Christians, a little bit broader than leadership, uh, for thinking Christians who either would identify as evangelical or maybe would have a beef with evangelicalism, which many do, would say, you know, I, I would no longer identify as evangelical because it's become too toxic a label um, these days. And there are many people who, who fall into that kind of place. And I wanted for, for those sort of people uh, to be able to put together a fundamentally biblical and theological case for the goodness of evangelicalism as properly defined. Hmm. Now, there are two things, of course. On one hand, there is the terminology. On the other hand, there is the actual content. And in, in the course of uh, no, the coming minutes, it will probably be clear what exactly you have in mind, though I think you, you're very clear about that in your book. Um, just a couple of uh, questions beforehand. Um, you give a specific definition of what being evangelical is. Um, there might be people either to the left or to the right of you who would identify evangelical slightly different? No, if you have people uh, who are a little bit on the left, no, who want to have justific justification by faith, more seen in terms of new perspective, or you know, the central claim of the New Testament is all about kingship and not about justification, or perhaps no, people to, more to the right, who would say, well, some of the ethical issues we face nowadays are actually at the core of what it means to be evangelical. So how would you respond to, to sort of, there are alternative possibilities out there, but I landed here. There are always going to be probing questions, would there? Uh, so I, in a sense, I, I wanted the real landing point and, and punch of the book to be towards the end in the last couple of chapters. But I felt that what I needed to do was actually explain what is the gospel to do exactly this, to say, what, what is the definition that means I'm not setting the agenda? So this is Reeves's cozy club of people who agree with him, <laughs> but this is actually people of the gospel. And so what I sought to do is provide in the book a definition of the gospel that's driven by scripture. So to be an evangelical is to be a person of the evangel. Now, just to step back for a moment there, often evangelicalism is defined in a cultural, sometimes political sense these days. But that's, that's a misuse of the term. Um, and it might be the case that, that that term has been so widely used, it's hard to see it in another way these days. But to be evangelical means to be a person of the evangel. To be a person of the evangel means that the gospel is the, the content. So what I sought to do in the book is look at how does the New Testament speak of what the gospel is. And deliberately to be able to say there's a certain breadth to the gospel and a, a narrowness to the gospel, and we need to be able to have both. Because if I'm making my definition of evangelicalism narrower than the biblical definition of the gospel, I'm being sectarian, which isn't evangelical and I'm undoing what I'm, I'm purporting to do. And if I make it broader, I'm equally, I, I'm actually watering down what the gospel is. So, so I went to, um, to the New Testament to try to define that. And a starting place um, that I used is looking at the first, so I, I, in, in many ways, the book is looking through the structure of Romans. 
But I use the first few verses of Romans um, to, to give us a head start on how we think of the gospel. And in the first four verses of Romans, Paul talks the apostle of the gospel of God, which is made known through his holy prophets in the scriptures concerning his son, who's declared with power to be the son of God through the Holy Spirit. But by the Holy Spirit, through the resurrection from the dead. And so what you've got there is, this is certain key statements about the gospel that Paul picks up on elsewhere many times through his epistles. And I, I pick out four marks here, that this is a biblical gospel, it's the gospel of God um, according to the scriptures. It's a Trinitarian gospel. It's the gospel of God, that is the Father, concerning the Son, who's declared to be Son of God with power through the Spirit. So, and in his day, so it's a biblical gospel, it's a Trinitarian gospel. It is a Christ-centered gospel, because it is the gospel of God concerning his Son. And it is Spirit-renewed, is in the power of the Spirit, the Son is made known. And that only took to be what Paul there and elsewhere in many places is setting out the good template for the table of contents for the gospel. There's neither too broad nor too narrow. And that's very important to try to do, to say there are th things personally I believe that, that are not gospel revelations that I don't believe passionately but I mustn't import them into the definition of gospel. We're coming back to this particular point almost to in your final chapter again. Um, the book is written by a British theologian, published by a North American uh, publisher, and the word evangelical has its own load its own content, its own association within the Anglo-Saxon world. Still, at the same time, though, based on what you have been saying, you, you also want to make the term evangelical something timeless, something universal when it comes to Christianity. So do you believe that the word evangelical should mean the same in every language? No? Uh, evangelisch, evangelique, uh, evangeliski. Um, what do you make of that? At bottom, I'm not really seeking to rescue the word evangelical. Just because I know that there are contexts in which, whether it's evangelical in English or um, evangelisch or um, uh, another comparable word, that uh, in some places, the word has such heavy connotations that to use it, even if you're thinking, I know what I mean by this, it will be heard with, uh, m maybe in the German-speaking world, with, with Lutheran, even Lutheran liberal connotations. Uh, maybe in the Swedish world, similarly. Um, in... In America, it can be heard with um, Republican right connotations. Um, and so there are different connotations in different parts of the world. And in some places, those are so strong that I say it's not about the word as such, it's about the content of the word. Now, I do think um, I would like to redeem the word if we could. And I think that some people are too pessimistic about um, the, uh, the ability of the word to be reclaimed. Because I think words, they, they're like stocks, they rise and fall in their value. And, and they can be reclaimed, though it needs to be done sensitively. But it's the content, really, that I care about. I, th I think this, this brings about one of the dilemmas throughout the book. That 
on one hand, you want to talk about the content because that is clearly where your heart is, you know, in, in the biblical gospel and to, to see that as, as a big rallying point and, and sort of that, that, that all gospel people though, should unite around and, and subscribe to. At, at the same time, now, I'm reading here for page 14, where you, you say, so what should it mean to be evangelical? Uh, and then further down the same uh, paragraph, uh, it is a distortion of the very meaning of the word evangelical to define it in any other way. Now, to be evangelical by definition, is not to be of a race or a party, but of the gospel." End quote. Um, I was thinking here, as a linguist, it, it almost feels as if you are doing some lexical study here, but a lexical study that is not descriptive, but prescriptive. Now, you do not hesitate to use the word must and should, mm. etc. Yeah. Um, to what extent can you get away with this approach to language and defining a term? Or would you say, no, actually, we should read it in light of what you just said. You're not doing linguistic work here, even though the language is used, but you're doing theological work and we should read you as theologian. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm looking at, since the word means to be of the gospel, then we should look at to meaning, uh, the meaning of evangelical as being defined by the gospel rather than defined by cultural, social, political issues. So that's that's where I'm wanting to be prescriptive, that that's what evangelical, the word itself, means. What I'm wanting to recognize, though, is people don't always hear that straight away. And so while I'd want to say it should mean that in our thinking, I recognize practically it actually doesn't for many people. Um, so I went back to my study and I found that wonderful book by Don Carson, Exegetical Fallacies. And he talks about all the dangers of word study. So I'm, I'm pushing back here a, a little bit. Where Don Carson says, I am simply saying that the meaning of a word cannot be reliably determined by etymology or that a root once discovered always projects a certain semantic load onto any word. Um, in short, words change their meaning over time. To what extent, though, are you fighting a fight that perhaps exegetes and linguists would say, really, a word is determined by its usage, not, not by any sort of prescriptive action? Well, it, it is practically in terms of its daily usage. Um, what people understand evangelical to mean is very far from being people of the gospel. I, I recognize that. Um, but that's, that's so far from what it has meant that that's what I wanted to call out, that don't be driven by a contemporary uh, assumption or even knee-jerk reaction on how evangelical sounds to you because that's not what the word was ever meant to imply. And of course, we, we have had other words that changed meaning quite dramatically and have been, well, irrevocably lost. For example, the word fundamentalist. No, it, that was used in the beginning of the 20th century for, for those Christians who you know, subscribe to the fundamentals, that sort of series of essays and, and pamphlets. And very quickly, it became to mean something we, we don't want it to mean anymore. And perhaps it's true for the term Catholic. Yeah. Catholic is a tricky term yeah. nowadays, even in the yeah. apostolic uh, no, confession, we, we tend to use general rather than Catholic to... Right. to uh, and and the, I think the reason I, I've, I have stuck on the word a little bit is while I, I... You know, so in the title, I'm saying gospel people. 
in the subtitle word evangelical comes up. But I'm being careful in my use of the word, but I don't want to let it go too easily, simply because I, I don't think there is something that describes being people of the gospel so well. So gospel people is about the best you can get if you ditch evangelical. That's fine if we go for that, but I can't see it catching on in the same way, right? And, and if we're to say we want to be people of the gospel, then I think you have people shifting their identity labels. And if we do keep shifting our identity labels, I think we'll look exactly as evangelicalism has often been typecast as historically naive and shallow, whereas actually evangelicalism has deep historical roots. So I, I don't want to give it up too quickly. Great. We're going to move to chapter two, which is the chapter on scripture. And I thought it was an absolute beautiful chapter. No, where you, you, you talk about uh, the role of Scripture, the reliability of Scripture, why it is trustworthy. Um, I have perhaps one minor detail question here. And that is, uh, at the beginning, no, as you explained already on the basis of Romans 1, there is that Trinitarian shape. And here in your book, you basically discuss scripture under the heading of the Father Reveals. Um, that's not normally done in systematic theologies, is it? To, to see scripture under the heading of Father. Why did you choose to do it this way, other than because it was so nicely suggested by Romans 1? So it was nicely suggested by Romans 1. And there was also, I think what I was trying to capture is um, systematically, uh, I wanted to be able to show how is the biblical gospel distinct from any other message. It, it is the gospel of the triune God and the work of the triune God. So I wanted to show the Trinitarian nature of the work of God. Um, so I've talked about the three R's of the gospel, of revelation, redemption, and regeneration. And redemption and regeneration are normally um, appropriated to the Son and the Spirit. So you're right, slightly less ordinarily is revelation appropriated to the Father, but actually the Father is the speaking one who speaks out his word. And so... The, the scriptures are often spoken of as the word of Christ, so you could speak of the revelation of Christ, but the scriptures are the revelation of Christ who is the revelation of the Father. And so what I was trying to do there is show we have a Trinitarian gospel and the full orb nature of that gospel involves revelation, redemption, and regeneration. And we can't leave out any of that if we're to be holistic in our understanding of the gospel. Now, one of the things you are doing, and I think you're doing it very well, is show the, the deep roots of being an evangelical, in the sense of evangelicals are not people who reject though, all the church tradition as if evangelicalism starts with us and there is no history whatsoever. Um, so, on page 33 in this chapter, you said, and I'm taking it out of context now, so I'll give you, give you a handle here. To be evangelical is to believe what the church as a whole has always taught. Are you basically saying that the church as a whole has always been evangelical, the church in the 11th century, in the 8th century, in the 4th century? Yes. Mainstream orthodox Christianity is evangelical in the sense that it is being people of the gospel, not in any modern connotation of how evangelicalism might be um, warped today. And and so one of the things I wanted to do in the book was show our belief, for example, in the supremacy, reliability, trustworthiness of Scripture. These are things you get to see 
in the early church fathers. And same with justification by faith alone and the regenerative work of the Spirit. Because I think that many evangelicals today have this sense that our history maybe goes back to the 18th century or possibly the Reformation, but before the Reformation, they're kind of sort of Roman Catholic. That They kind of lean Roman Catholic. And then there's this break with Luther, and so we're the schismatic ones. And, and of course, that's very much Rome's argument, that we stand in absolute continuity, and, and the Protestants are the deviants here. And so what I wanted to try to prove a little bit with some quotations from um, early church fathers is no, um, actually, these core evangelical beliefs that we have they are the beliefs that are stand in direct continuity with the orthodox teaching of the early church fathers. Does that make people you have cited, such as Tertullian and Basil from the 4th century, does that make them evangelicals, even though, though they are very strong on individual parts of what evangelicals hold, but perhaps in, in other ways also do a couple of other things that are perhaps yeah, I, I, as obvious. I don't want to say that any one person is a consistent evangelical um, because we're all sinners, um, we're all eccentric in various ways and we have a tendency to either add or subtract from the gospel. And certain ages have tendencies to, to errors in particular directions. But I think what I get to see um, in patristics, for example, when I teach patristics, one of the things I enjoy seeing and showing students is that the evangelicalism of early church fathers is far more robust than they tend to think it is. Let me give an example, if I may. Um, so take a um, Cyril of Alexandria. So Cyril of uh, Alexandria, would be sort of viewed, I think, by most evangelicals, because you see this strange-looking icon. He sort of looks Eastern Orthodox to you, or looks a bit Roman Catholic to you, but because of the pictures, and you haven't read him. But, and if he's a hero theologically, it's because, well, he stood up for an Orthodox view of who the person of Jesus Christ is. What evangelicals don't always think through is, one of the reasons he's standing up for an Orthodox view of the person of Christ is because he's fighting for an orthodox view of Christ's salvation. He's absolutely fighting for a salvation by grace um, and not by our, our own effort and works. And I think that sort of thing is surprising to us today, but, but lovely and affirming for us to see. Which moves us on neatly to the, to the third chapter which is called Redemption by the Son. And there's basically two pillars in this chapter. Well, the first is the big question, who is Jesus? And you, 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 you give a very clear, now you unpack very clear who Jesus is. And then the second is about how we are saved. And you place a lot of emphasis, and I think absolutely rightly so, on the doctrine of justification by faith alone. Um, at this point in the book, I was almost thinking that you would do more than positively unpacking what the gospel is and perhaps also have some denials with it, what it is not. Can you understand that there was sometimes that, that yeah. itch? Absolutely, absolutely. So, so I felt, in a sense, I, I, I wanted just to lay out what the gospel is there in that sort of central section of the book. But I think what you're actually um, stretching towards is, do you know, when I wrote the last paragraph of the book, the last paragraph of the conclusion, I just wrote the, the very last sentence of it. And as soon as I did the full stop, I, I immediately went to email, and I went to email my editor. And I, I said, do you know what? I've just finished the book, and now I've done it. I think it needs a second book. <laughs> um, 
because I thought there'd be a number of people asking this sort of question, going, if that's the case, then so what? And also, I thought there'd be a number of people who'd read it and go, yes, yes, I, I agree with all that. And I wanted to push it to say, really? Is, do you actually live with integrity to that? Do you actually uh, have consistency with that? And so I, um, after a discussion with the editor, I wrote a, a second volume, which is the companion volume to this, called Evangelical Pharisees. Because as I saw it, and I see, I see it, the Pharisees are the perfect inversion of the gospel. They're perfectly denying these three main areas of the gospel. And so I just wanted to pick that out and show how that actually feeds through even into modern evangelicalism. So that those who call themselves evangelical actually are in many ways not being robustly evangelical. Can I get you on tape with the following deal? You make sure we all get a copy of that book next year and we'll do an interview <laughs> on that book. <laughs> I'd like to try it. I did have some copies here today. I've just given my last one away. Um, coming back on Oh, mining the Christian tradition and, and appreciate the, the, the deep roots in tradition that, that we as evangelicals have. Um, is that connection to the church of the past a necessary element of being an evangelical? Or is it a wise element of being an evangelical? Yeah, I, I think it, it, it's better to say it's a wise element. Um, that uh, I think it's it's possible to to be a um, an evangelical believer and be entirely ignorant of church history and historical theology. And I would say that's a great shame, but you can be a believer and have that ignorance. So it's not it's not essentially necessary. But I think it is wise, and it's a wisdom that many evangelicals don't have, because God gives us his word, uh, gives his word to his church to be read together. And, and it seems to me that in modern evangelicalism, there is too much of a, we'll listen to living saints, but not the dead saints. And just statistically speaking, you've got to think there are more mature dead Christians than live ones. So wouldn't you want to get the wisdom of the church past? Wouldn't you want to be able to get the wisdom of some mighty saints like a, an Augustine or an Athanasius or a Calvin, Luther, Edwards? Now, then we go to chapter four, you know, regeneration through the spirit. Um, it seemed to me that here the the definition, the treatment of being an evangelical shifted a little bit in the sense of when you were talking about the word, you are talking about something that is. When talking about the Lord Jesus and who he is and how he has saved, we're talking about someone who is. Well, when we're talking about regeneration through the spirit, we are more talking about something that should be rather than something that is, in the sense that, no, evangelicals are people who should commit their life to the gospel and reflect it in any way. Is that a fair observation? I'd, I'd say no, not quite, actually, because I don't think you really can be a person of the gospel unless you are born of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. um, th there's just not an integrity there. Um, and so what I'm trying to get at in, in that chapter is that to be a person of the gospel is not simply, that while we do have doctrines we believe, it's not simply that we, we believe a list of doctrines, that the truths of the gospel in the power of the Spirit turn our hearts and affect us. And by regeneration there, I'm actually using the word in a slightly old-fashioned sense. So theologians today use regeneration for being born again. And I'm meaning it in that way, but also, as well as the need for the Spirit to give us new hearts and a new life, 
I'm also using the, the word regeneration in terms of ongoing renewal in the power of the Spirit. And both of those are essential. That overall, that initial regeneration and that ongoing regeneration are essential for true integrity to the gospel. Yeah, I think I couldn't agree more, but, but still, now I need to come up with some probing questions. I would have been exciting if we had disagreed there. That's right. Uh, gosh, that would, uh, be, that would be bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, chapter 5, the importance of being gospel people. So here you, you're talking almost about now doing a theological triage and you're distinguishing between primary, secondary and tertiary issues. And, and this is where the, the, the rubber starts to hit the right. road here. I, I oh. saw this and the next one were the two most important chapters in many ways of the book. Um, so I would like to ask you, when it comes to the primary issues of being an evangelical. Are these the same primary issues of being a Christian? So how, how does that work? Is it yeah. that in order for no, being evangelical, being gospel people, which is a narrower set than what we say could call world Christianity? So, I would say no, not quite the same, in that uh, you can, I think it's possible to have a, say, a non-evangelical view of scripture and still be a Christian. L let me give an example. So Jesus clearly teaches in Matthew 15, Mark 7, a number of other places, um, that scripture is the word of God and therefore scripture cannot be broken. It, um, it's the totally trustworthy, supremely authoritative word of God. Now, I think it is, well, it is definitely possible to be saved as a Christian because we are justified by faith alone and not our agreement with certain doctrines. It's impossible for someone to be a Christian and not believe in the total trustworthiness of Scripture. But you're not an evangelical, if you'd say that. So you could say, yes, I trust in Jesus, and you might have a saving faith, but for some reason you have not affirmed the total trustworthiness of Scripture. I think you can still be saved, but you're not an evangelical. That, that's not following what Jesus' teaching in Scripture is. But in the hierarchy of labels, you would put evangelical as the, the one to be desired more than the label Christian. Insofar as you're claiming I am a person of the gospel, yes. Yeah. Um, th this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It, we, we don't want it to be separable from Christian. We, we want evangelicalism, uh, I'm going to say it should be plain, mere, biblical Christianity. And, and anything else is, is a deviation from that because it's a deviation from the gospel. So we have now very much developed that, that concept of the universal evangelical church uh, no, through, through century, through places. Um, then in, in chapter five, you, uh, you have a quote by Don Carson where almost evangelicals are contrasted with, uh, or at least the breadth within evangelicalism is contrasted with the breadth of theological work done in Presbyterian theology or in, uh, gosh, in Reformed thought. But to what extent have we then come back to evangelical as almost a sociological label rather than as the ideal label? Is this part of the confusion in terminology? I think that's exactly what the confusion is. And so what I wanted to try to deal with there is the fact that people will say evangelicalism as a thing is necessarily um, fractious. It is necessarily, um, because it's a child of the Reformation, evangelicalism by its nature is juvenile and historically unaware. And I want to say, all traditions have got their shallow ends, 
but that doesn't mean that that's part of the essential nature of evangelicalism. So yes, I want to parse the difference between what it, um, what it is and what it, it becomes socially. Now then, later uh, in, the, in the chapter, you basically you know, grasp, the, grasp the nettle with bare hands or, or whatever, where you say, uh, it asks the question, if evangelicals seek a manifested spiritual unity, what should they make of all our denominations? Um, and I think that is a very brilliant question. Um, could you outline the answer you're yeah. giving here? Sure. Um, what I've tried to argue is that um, true unity in the gospel is not an institutional unity. That's a Roman Catholic idea, that you need one man ruling it, and it's one institution we're all part of. But we all fall into that very quickly. And so we tend to think we're not united unless we're part of the same denomination. But actually, um, true unity is not a structural organizational thing. It's a spiritual unity. And it's a spiritual unity to be found for evangelicals in those primary first level issues of the gospel. Now that means that Dirk and I can have a heartfelt ministry together in unity here at ELF and disagree on baptism. And that's okay. Now, what that practically means is, assuming we do, um, I'm sure we don't really, but because um, he's a very bright biblical scholar. Um, but assuming we do, that means that in terms of local church attendance, it's, it's going to be difficult for us to attend the same local church or be part of the same denomination. But that doesn't mean that we lack a fundamental evangelical unity. It'll mean we can be in different denominations, and those local churches and denominations, and even more the individuals within them, can actually be in the warmest gospel unity with each other. We're going to chapter 6, which has the title, Gospel Integrity. And here you need to help me a little bit as a uh, non-native speaker of, of, of English. Um, I have a fair, fairly good idea, I think, what integrity is. Now, when you talk about a person of integrity, that is somebody who, who, who lives their life according to, to high moral standard without sort of any th hypocrisy within it. Now you put the word gospel in front of it. What sort of integrity yes. are we talking about? What does adding a noun in front of integrity yes. change? What can you be more specific so and help me let's out? Let's push on the word a little bit. So integrity is to do with like being an integer, is to do with oneness. And so it's precisely that lack of hypocrisy that what your, let's say it's moral integrity, what your moral code is, you actually live by it. So your life has integrity to that moral. Now we tend to just use integrity in that way, but actually I think there int integrity, um, I want to use it in two different ways. One, to say it is not so much some morals that we're finding our integrity to, it is the gospel itself. And the gospel places particular demands on us, and we are seeking to have lives that are one with that gospel. Not lives that are one simply with a moral code, which is often how integrity is read. It's lives that are shaped by uh, justification by faith alone, shaped by um, the regenerative work of the Spirit in our hearts. But there is something else about that oneness of integrity, that it's not just about an individual oneness of life being shaped by the gospel. It's also about oneness together. Because when Paul makes his gospel plea at the end of Philippians 1, 
He pleads that the Philippians might live lives worthy of the gospel, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel of Jesus. And so gospel integrity requires both a personal oneness with the gospel and a corporate oneness together in the gospel. And that word, I think, captures something that no other word quite does. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, then you, you say, and it's almost a throwaway remark, um, and I thought it quite interesting. You say on page 115, C.S. Lewis, no card carrying evangelical himself. What is it that makes C.S. Lewis not a card carrying evangelical? I think there'd be a few things. Um, so he was a high church Anglican. Um, he would share some beliefs with evangelicals, but a classic one would be his belief in purgatory, for instance. Um, and so if you believe in purgatory, then that means you don't believe in the completely sufficient work of Christ. That means there is nothing that I need to do to have my sins purged further after death. So there's just, there must be a difference to the evangelical gospel. And so I suppose that what I'm trying to do in phrasing it like that is to say, he's not a card carrying evangelical. He would differ with, with myself and others who would hold to these um, evangelical beliefs. But that's not to say I don't find him stimulating, useful. I don't think he's a brother. Yeah. Um, so now we're on the subject of uh, C.S. Lewis. He wrote that book, Mere Christianity. What is the difference between mere Christianity and gospel people? How would you define the difference yeah. between the books? Um, well, in, in terms of the books, he, he's trying to um, do an evangelistic work, an apologetic work of why you should be a Christian. What I'm trying to spell out more, in a way he doesn't really try to do in mere Christianity so much, is what is this mere Christianity that we can then find our identity in and unite around? So in a sense, I'm not trying to quite win you to it, but I want to lay it out. And I want to lay it out because it feels that in our age, we've got so much tribalism and blurring of the gospel that there are people who are saying, I don't want to be associated with, um, with evangelicals because I'm, I'm more orthodox than that. Or I don't want to be associated with evangelicals because they've got a tighter orthodoxy than I have. And so I wanted to lay out, okay, what is um, the mere Christianity of the gospel? And I think if we can have a good understanding of this, it could mean we could have more beautiful, clearly thought through unity. Um, about the, the unity, so, so basically in my final question before we throw it open to, uh, to, to you guys to, uh, to fill the remainder of the time with your questions. Um, I actually have two questions. If we, if, so when I read the book and I look back on it, um, of course, we talked about some of the things you did not mention. And I was reflecting back on that chapter, Regeneration by the Spirit. And one of the things, of, well, there are many things you don't do. Of course, there are always more things that you do not do than, than you do. But that you almost stay clear of the major ethical issues we are facing nowadays. Uh, and many of the uh, ethical issues have to do either with sexual identity or, or other behavioral issues. No, it's, it's, that's, for, that's why it's ethics. Is that deliberate that you st uh, discussed the whole regeneration uh, of the spirit more in biblical and theological terms than try to draw practical implications of that in this book. 
Yes, it, yeah, it is deliberate. Um, and I think that there is, um, in our day, uh, there is often a confusion between the theological and the moral. And people aren't able to make that distinction. And I think it's necessary to do so um, for the sake of saying, what is unity in the gospel? Otherwise, I think we'll get confused on what the gospel is. And in many ethical debates now, I think moral issues are sometimes being treated as salvific theological issues in and of themselves. And while they might be hugely significant issues, there's a confusion of categories that easily happens there. Thank you. Final question. How do we teach this evangelical truth to the next generation? I mean, a lot of your reading strategy of scripture and your reading strategy of many of the folk you're, you're citing assumes a pretty direct one-on-one -on -one relation between the text and its obvious meaning. And that is so refreshing of the book. But my youngsters are growing up in a world where there is no longer the assumption that there is necessarily an honest relationship between something that is written 2,000 years ago and something that Mike Reeves writes for all sorts of sinister purposes in and of itself. So how can we be evangelicals and, and teach even evangelicalism in a world that has adopted radically different attitudes to scripture and in practice a different attitude to writing in general? Mm. I, I think at the heart of it, to give the simplest possible answer, um, is to enable the next generation to be well associated with scripture for themselves. And by, the, by adding that for themselves, I don't simply mean teaching them, but getting them to be engaging with scripture themselves. And the reason for that is that they then pick up their own biblical literary nose for how scripture actually works and how literature can work. That even if Reeves' sinister purposes in that book are profoundly dark and disturbing, you can see in scripture the purposes of writing being loving and caring and pastoral, and you can pick that up and therefore realize that while some authors might write with dark purposes, it's clearly not all. So I think a, a deeper engagement with scriptures is the primary thing, which hopefully is a really encouraging answer for people to go, that's a simple one we can all do.